Hi, I'm Freddie Gillespie. I'm the chair of the South for Open Space Preservation Commission, and we're hosting this event tonight. And this is about how we take care of our own yards. And how that relates to the Open Space Preservation Commission for the town is what we do to preserve land involves one of the reasons we do that is for um, wildlife habitat and preserving native species and taking care of just a parcel here and then a parcel over there it's not enough what we do in our own yards has an impact and species that are going extinct um, some of them like bumblebees and um, fireflies or lightning bugs what you're doing in your own backyard has an impact bigger than we have previously really identified so what happened, um, so we have had a few presentations on different activities. Um, the Open Space Commission, we just did a caterpillar lab. Um, last year we had a few presentations on native plants and uh, bumblebee. We're doing a bumblebee survey at Breakneck Hill Conservation Land that actually is impacting the state wildlife habitat um, conservation uh, requirements for the state. Um, we're having more and more impact on people learning about what they're doing in their own yards and in their neighborhoods. So a couple of books um, you can get here at the library and we're really thankful for the library for hosting us. This one here is Attracting Native Pollinators, a great book um, library got for us and I just reserved these, that's why my name's on them because um, Richard Berry, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, recommended them to me, but you can get them through the library. Noah's Garden, and planting Noah's garden. So the library is a great resource and these two books, highly recommended, and one that is actually not available to show you is Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home. Changed my life when I read it and um, I actually heard a presentation by him. It is available at the library, you can reserve it. They don't have one here now, but other libraries do. It is like, um, really, makes you see the world in a different way. What we're doing, you know, with native species that we need to be more aware of in our own yards is really important. So, for, I want to tell you how I heard about Richard Berry. Um, in this day and age, um, I'm on a Facebook group called uh, Native Plants of New England. And I saw this person, a gentleman, posting pictures of his own yard. And little by little, he changed it from a sterile, uh, lawn, just suburban yard to this unbelievable wildlife sanctuary is what I would call it in his own yard, plant by plant. And then um, as I watched him over a year or two, we became Facebook friends and he's friends with other friends I know or I've worked with, he, uh, he started his own company. So he seemed like a good fit to um, bring on board, especially last year when we had the drought and watering lawns was a real problem, not so much this year, but he wasn't you know, spending any time watering. That's what using native plants can do. A little hard sell this year when we've had so much water, but there's, that's a good reason. We're gonna have droughts again, but there's many other reasons to um, use native plants. So, I'm gonna introduce Richard Berry, thank you. Hi. Thank you all so much for coming to come and listen to me discuss something that is really near and dear to me and um, is something that, like what Freddie mentioned, that is now I'm doing professionally. I started, like, I was a supervisor with the U.S. government for about 16 years. I was in charge of the agriculture inspection program for the, the Port of Boston. We were first part of USDA and then we moved into become part of um, U.S. Customs with the whole DHS thing and all that but I just left from there back in March and I've been been doing this uh, finally as a job which is which has been great because um, basically I ran I a lot of the things that I've done with my own property um, I are maybe a little bit beyond what a lot you know a lot of people would necessarily want to do with their own yards but I just I started basically you know section by section I started, um, we moved into our house, and we live in Andover, uh, my family and I, and we moved there back in 2009, and uh, it was all, like, like Freddie had mentioned, it was all just grass, there was a few, few trees, there was a lot, a lot of actually invasive species 
there was a uh, well and and things that I are kind of I guess kind of quasi invasive like Brad uh, Bradford pears um, which is not it's not technically considered invasive species in this state yet but I think it will be it, it, I think it really tech actually is but uh, so we moved you know we moved in there and I, I immediately like we were looking at the property and I envisioned like what I wanted to turn it into and the very first thing I did was I started um, I, I did dug out a spot to put a vegetable garden in but then just kind of just kind of flowed from there um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I basically I just put together a slideshow of a lot, you know, the different different things I've done with with our property and uh, some of the some of the like the flower photos that I I, I really like the, the number the the number and the diversity of flowers with this project is just I mean we all the time I swear from maybe not so much early in the spring when there's crocus you know the crocuses are coming up and the daffodils and some of those things like there aren't there aren't any native species that are that early. But we actually have a lot of daffodils around the garden anyways that were just left over from the, the previous owners. They, were, you know, they had like some garden beds here and there and there were daffodils and, and, they, and they're, still, they're still there and they're still growing. But, um, other than, but basically from like April all the way through November, right up to when the ground freezes solid, you, you, there's things flowering all, all the time. Like we always have more stuff flowering in our yard than like literally every other property on the street put, <laughs> put together. It's crazy. So. Um, this is just what I came up with for a title. I, it sounds a little bit overly dramatic, probably to say building an ecosystem, because you basically, like the way I look at it is, this, this is the, the way I look at, what, um, and, and, I've, and I've, been, I've translated this into what I'm doing now for work too, but I, I, the way I look at, um, so, so you have an area of lawn or you have some kind of plantings or some, or some kind of land, and, you, and the way I look at what will do well there, not like, oh, I like this kind of plant and I want to change the conditions to, you know, try to make it make it work sometimes they do sometimes they don't you know you bring in extra soil and you have to water them all the time and fertilize and um you know and a lot of people use pesticides I, I don't use any pesticides on anything even organic pesticides i have probably 600 square feet of vegetable garden space and I, you know bugs eat some stuff um, but it's what what what, what this building an ecosystem kind of gets to is what I've found, just from my own experience, and I've, you know, I've kind of picked this up here and there, you know, in, in, in reading and all too, but just from my own direct experience that as you, you know, when you, number one thing, you don't use pesticides. Um, I, don't, I don't use any, I, don't, I, I, I will, I'll, I'll say, like, if I'm going to be working on a project and there's, you know, there's a certain area of, of, of lawn there, I will use herbicides sometimes. Sometimes it really is the, the, best, the best way to deal with it. One time application, and then that's it. You know, and then it's done. Then you, you go in and you and you re replace that lawn area with, um, you know, a na native meadow or, or sh shrubs or whatever. You know, or whatever it may be. I, I don't. I probably would not put a vegetable garden on an area that I killed with Roundup. But <clears throat> it doesn't really. You know, there's not really any reason to anyway in that kind of situation. But um, anyway, so. This is the ecosystem that I built. The, uh, oh, the what I was going, what I was going to get to was that the pest, the, the the insect pests, not all. There's some things you 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 know I'll get on the vegetables like that just drive me crazy, like flea beetles and cabbage, um, you know the cabbage white butterfly larvae that just tear up the uh, you know everything, broccoli and and collard greens and kale and all that stuff. But for the most part, though. There's there's so many predator, predatory insects and parasitic insects and not to mention birds and and we have you know we've little pe people complain about it like things like chipmunk oh, the chipmunks come and they eat everything so I, we have chipmunks all over the place and uh, they eat they eat some things they eat some of the strawberries they eat you know they're in, it's like with the rabbits they they can be annoying but things eat them too and uh, we have coyotes we have owls we have hawks we have foxes we have all these kind of things that come around and it it just kind of all builds on itself and that you have these the, the, the you have other insects and other animals that control the, the pests and, and believe it or not I mean I have um, it's it's a third of an acre our, our, our property and we're surrounded there's a bit of woods in back but other than that it's um, it's pretty much just the typical you know um, weed free lawns and and you know plantings and stuff um, all around us so we're kind of an island in, in the area but uh, anyway this is just a picture I just took this morning because this is um, this just kind of shows, like, like, I don't know how many people are, 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 are like frogs, but I, I love them. I'm a huge frog fan, and so I built, I built a pond in our backyard three years ago. Um, it's only like 16 feet by like eight, um, couple, two feet deep, and like within 
a week, frogs moved in, I have frogs. This is the second pond. I just, I just put these rocks in yesterday. This was just basically like a hole in the ground with just like a, a rubber liner until yesterday when I spent the whole day like doing the rocks and everything. And then immediately, like this morning, there's, th there's three, uh, you, they're, they're a little bit hard to make, but those are actually baby green frogs that came from tadpoles that um, grew up in our other pond. So, which I, I, I was amazed, I, actually. That's what I was hoping for, to have tadpoles in there and actually have frogs reproducing, but they, they, they have. And these, yeah, this was, this was one day after this kind of came, started resembling an actual pond. The, the, the water's very cloudy right now still because I put a lot of sand in there and it's just kind of, it's stir, stirred up the bottom a lot and all that. It's, but I still have to plant it. I still have a lot I have to do. But uh, the, the frogs aren't waiting. See, that's what it looks like right now. It's pretty, you know, pretty filthy looking right now, but it's a big, big change. And, and, there, and the, the original pond isn't back there. Um, this is what was there before in 2009. Um, pretty much no. And, so obviously it's just there's, there's grass to where it's you know there's no grass it's just a, a dead area that was being mowed over and pretty much all the shrubs and everything in there and like but the, the trees are all are pretty much all native all the shrubs were all invasive species in there so i got rid of all those and now it's full of tons of native shrubs this is this is our original pond um but that's a blue flag iris and uh i, I it's 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 a bit of work putting in putting in a pond, but it's not really as you can do it as ela in, in as in as elaborate a way as as you want. I mean, people spend enormous enormous sums of money on doing doing ponds with waterfalls and filters and sorts of, all sorts of fish and all this kind of thing. Um, the, fundamentally, all you all all it really needs is just basically a hole. You dig a hole in the ground. Um, and then uh, line it with, this is just lined with a rubber liner. And then, you know, you tuck in all the edges and you put in, like I, I, I my whole thing with this was to make it as natural as possible. <laughs> so that's, that's what I went for. There's no fish um, and uh, just, just frogs and dragonflies and things like that. But uh, I'm really happy with how it turned out. I have a stream that feeds into it all. So this is from another angle. There's a white water lily in there. That's, so these are all native plants. I, I, I landscaped it exclusively with all native. Everything around here is na native species. Um, so you know, you get just the, the amount of life, the amount of pollinating insects, and just um, you know, but, birds and butterflies and living things around is just, is just amazing. Um, this is the pond later on in the season here. Oh, and let me just let me just throw out there also. If anybody has any questions, feel free to just you know, I, I'm I'm you know, I, I'm doing this for, you know, very informally, so um, I guess there's going to be a question and answer period a, a, at the end as well, but if you want, yeah. So when you have that shot that showed the piece of, I guess, a shed with the woods, um, you said you had pulled out some, like, you mentioned shrubs, but I didn't really see, it looked like really clean woods to me. There isn't, yeah, there isn't so much. you had pulled stuff out of there? Like no, the they were in there. Um, yeah, there is. It's like, like way cleaner than the woods at my house. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think that's because this this area was just just like what happens the, the way like willow wooded areas are treated around. So this, I think it was just basically a, a, a dumping ground, and just it was just it was just abused and beaten on for you know like they there's some kind of a, like a uh, what do you call it a water drain drain right away like an easement that goes through the that's that's our neighbor's property and back there but I guess they there was a stream back when until the 50s or 60s and they they dug it all up and they put it in a pipe underground that runs through back there so it's just it's just been all you know turned over every which way and everything and uh, but yeah pretty much there's not a whole lot in, in this particular shot but all, all the pretty much all the shrubs back there were all they were things like um, glossy buckthorn common buckthorn Winged euonymus, the bit, there was bittersweet, there was uh, Norway maples all over the place, all these, these things that are just, you know, everywhere. Um, but they just, th this time of year, you know, time of year too, it's, it, there's no leaves on anything, so it's, it looks a lot even more sparse than it really is, which is still pretty sparse. Um, and it's amazing, you know, oh, again, okay, with this pond, how close, this, this, this photo wasn't today, but, but uh, how clean the water stays in there. This with no fill, I have no filter. I, 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 did, I do have a stream that runs into it. There's a 45 foot long stream that I, I, I as another I photo later on, but uh, that runs and it, and, it, and it enters the pond right there. Um, 
and it was working great for a while, but I think that but basically there's a, there's a buried hose that goes under and it, it connects the pond up to the top of the stream it go, and then the, then the water comes out and it just circulates around and around. Um, I think that there's a leak in the hose, so it's kind of been losing water. So I, I've been keeping that off, but it's just kind of nice. There's little waterfalls, there's a, str a stream and everything. It's just, you know, it's, the sound is nice and it looks nice. But I got to get that, that uh, hose thing straightened out. So this, it, it, I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, vernal, vernal pools in, in the, in the, to me this really looks like a, ver a vernal pool. It's not because it doesn't, you know, a vernal, vernal pool dries out in the summer, this doesn't, but um, it is similar to a vernal pool in the way that the, one of the big, besides the fact vernal pools dry out in the summer, they also never have any, well that kind of, you know, is responsible for why there's no fish either. So that's, then there's no fish in this one. So you get, you get different kinds of aquatic life and, and um, I mean, that's just the whole thing with, with vernal pools. Things, things will live in there that won't live in, in permanent bodies of water where there's fish. So I don't even, I mean, there's, there's a lot of dragonfly larvae in there, which is neat, because dragonflies are great, are great predators. Oh, and then it's, it's going back, mosquitoes. There's like no, there were mosquitoes. You can see, you know, the little wigglers in there for around for a little while after I put that pond in, but I swear it wasn't a few weeks, and you couldn't even find them, and that's because of the, the frogs, for one thing. You know, they're ravenous. And uh, the dragonflies were, were, you know, the drag dragonfly larvae are aquatic, so they're, they're, they're in there, and other kinds of insects. And it just, you know, so it, um, it all kind of regulates itself. But this is what it looked like, our front yard looked like before. Um, pretty much grass and some plantings. All these trees, everything in there's everything's gone. I got rid of all this. That's a Bradford pear. That spruce was the, the Christmas tree looking thing in back was growing up into the power lines to the house. So I, I, that, you know, that could pretty much took care of that. And that dogwood, they were the same thing. So and all the bushes in front of the house, I got rid of them all. Um, everything is non-native. Some things are invasive. That's kind of what that area looks like now. It's me there. <laughs> and, oh, and there's a monarch butterfly on the, uh, in the lower left there. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm my wife, I think, why she took this picture. We don't, uh, I, I keep, I, I, we have so much milkweed and I just keep hoping for the day when a monarch shows up again and actually lays eggs on something. I, you know, it happened if, like three or four years ago, but I got a lot of milkweed for him though. This is the front of our house now. Um, this is oxeye sunflower, the yellow plant, which is Heliopsis helianthoides. The orange one is butterfly weed, which I have 18 of available right there if anybody's interested. Um, the white one is New Jersey tea. Um, which just looks, I think the two of the New Jersey tea and butterfly weed together just looks fantastic. And, and those are two, again, with the, 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 the low maintenance kind of, a, kind of a thing, theme and all that. Both of those, well, pretty much everything in this photo, but, but butterfly weed and New Jersey tea will, I, I, th I think they will survive any drought and be like, won't even show any problem at all. I mean, I, I've heard some people say oh, I have butterfly weed and it was in a place that was too dry. I, I, I don't know. This is a very, very sandy, very dry um, spot right here, right above that wall. Um, never gets water, never gets anything. And, and, and the butterfly weed and the, the, uh, the yellow, the, the oxy sunflower, they self see. I, another thing I do, and this is, you know, you don't have to. You, 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 don't, you don't need to go to an extreme. You can just do, you know, you can do a se you know, one section, you can do a little garden bed, you know. Um, and that's actually how I started this out. I mean, I did this in piece by piece. Um, I never would have been able, I did it all myself. I never would have been able to do it in one big, you know, one big thing. Um, but uh, those things are basically drought-proof, uh, in, my, in my experience, and they self-seed all over the place. So, you know, uh, not everybody likes that. You know, and things are, you know, that's why people dead. Well, you deadhead plants are supposed to make them produce more flowers, but it also the other thing it does is they don't produce any seed. Um, I, and actually, like the, the there's a purple comb flower in there too, just the one I think. Or actually, there's some smaller ones in by the wall too, but. The seeds on those, we get flocks of goldfinches that come in all the, all the time in the fall, and they come in, they, they just clean the seeds off of those things. And a lot of them, they just throw all over the place too, and so you, you, get, uh, you, know, you get little seedlings coming up all around. But, you know, they're really easy to move. You can pull them out if you don't want them. Um, I, I just look at it as like free plants, and they're also, the thing that I love about self-seeding is, 
and it's a whole, just a whole different kind of a way of looking at things from the typical, you know, garden does, okay, oh, I'm going to put this plant here and this thing there and this thing here. And it's, you know, you can start it out. It, it, does design is still, I mean, th this is design. This isn't just like a whole bunch of things just planted every which way and everything. But I like to create like sort of the framework. You know, there's, there's shrubs in here, there's trees, there's, you know, the, the, some of the, th some of these things like these grasses, these are a little blue stem and, and these, you know, they're planted where they are, but, you know, they'll move, but they kind of just, you know, select the places that they like best, which is the way I look at it. I think it's kind of neat. Like, and a lot of times the original plant will die, you know. Uh, voles in the winter will eat all the roots and we, I get that sometimes. Some area, you know, there'd be an area maybe four foot around where everything's, de everything's dead, it's just bare soil. But they fill that those spaces like that, and it, it doesn't, you know, maybe one or two places like that in the yard in the whole the whole winter. But they'll fill right in with plants right away too, and and they're mostly native. You know, you get some weeds still now and then, but that's just, that's been a neat thing with this whole project also is that the things that are weeds now are mostly <laughs> they're things like butterfly weed. Well, I mean, it's called you know. I always thought, well, you know, why is it called a weed? It doesn't, you know, it it, it it'll, it'll behave kind of it'll 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 sprout up quite a bit. But uh, those are the things that I get is mostly weeds, so <laughs> not the, you know, crab. Crabgrass is pretty much just fizzled out. This is um, from a little bit further back. The, the pink ones are wild bergamot. This, and that, oh, there's a tall, that's a joe pie weed. Wild bergamot and is this, you know, kind of pinkish lavender flower. There's purple cone flower and then more of the oxi sunflower and everything. But, and then there's a lot, of, a lot of the things that just look like, and this was, I think this was last year in the drought, too. So it looks a little bit more shabby probably than it like normally would, but all the things that are just green right now are mostly fall flowering plants like asters and goldenrods. And Richard, you didn't water last year, did you? No, I never, I mean, I watered the vegetables a little bit. Um, but not this flower garden? No, no, nothing. No, I mean, I... Can you tell us again what the grasses were that you had in that garden? Um, yeah, well, li little blue stem is, is, it's one of my overall all around it's one of my favorite grasses i i don't understand i do not understand why all like 99 percent of the ornamental grasses you ever see in a in, in a garden center are non-native species they're all japanese silver grass and fountain grass and i have yeah, some of these these others they're the same the th same things you always see and and it's you know they're a low maintenance too but a lot of those like the, 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 some of those, those non-native grasses are actually invasive, or they're, they're in becoming invasive as well. And things like little blue stem, so believe it or not, it's funny to think of a grass, but there's actually native butterflies that their caterpillars, that's what they eat, they feed on that. And native sedges, a lot, that's a, all, there, I don't think that there's a single native plant species that we have in this region, or any, certainly anything you're ever going to find available for, for sale or anything that doesn't support native butterflies, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the larvae. Um, there's so many different specialist insects and things that really need, like, you know, a certain type of plant, things like that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, is your property, like, all sandy soil or are parts of it clay soil? It's pretty sandy, yeah. Where we are, it, it tends, to be, tends to be pretty sandy. Um, I've especially with the vegetable beds, like I've added a ton of organic matter to them and everything, but, but st still, yeah. And, um, you know, any of those types of conditions, oh, that's, yeah, any of those types of conditions, like if it's, you know, sand, soil, clay, soil, wet, dry, sunshade, um, those, those, those types of things are all, you know, th they're all things that you can just take into account and then just, you know, s select your, your species that you're going to use based on that like that's really that's really the like for sandy soils sandy bone dry soil I, I i actually with one corner up in the front here i actually added a lot of sand well not not per, i didn't go to the store and buy sand but i when i ex excavated out the pond and back this the soil down underneath was like very very sandy and so i, I actually um but pretty much like dumped like just off to the side of here i, I dumped all the, before i did this I, I i basically regraded the slope with all that and made it more sandy and i did that mainly because i have some prickly pear cactus in there too <laughs> and uh, that likes it really sandy and really really good drainage Prick, but prickly pear butterfly weed new jersey tea yeah they all love little blue stem they love sand they uh they can't get enough and what's the woody strawberry in that
that the, right in the middle with the little the, the that's a um, that's a service berry amelanchier that's a um, autumn brilliance I'm, I don't usually go with cultivars like that's a whole like esoteric discussion about cultivar native ours and all this type of thing um, we've been involved in yeah that being said I mean it, how it, native is native yeah, exactly. I uh, this is this is a, it's a hybrid service berry. It's a hybrid between two different native species, and from all accounts, it doesn't affect its value. You know, it doesn't negatively affect its value to wildlife or to anything at all, really. So I, I think that I think hybrids even occur in nature and everything too. So you know, I mean, I wouldn't like if I'm going to plant a hundred a hundred plants or something. I don't really want them all to be exactly identical clones. But the, you know, but. Uh, in this case, yeah, it's, it's it's an autumn brilliant service berry, apple service berry. That, there it is. <laughs> I just like that one because it's. I don't normally I don't normally plant like the lar larger you know trees like this, but I did for that spot, and we went to the nursery and picked it out. That's my son. He was uh, four, I think then. <laughs> these are wild lupins, and these are the very few people know know this but the, the, this is actually like the lupins that you go up to Maine and the coast and you see the lupins all around there you know they're 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 four, four, three or four feet tall and they they're purple and they're, they're beautiful they're nice nice looking plants and everything but they're not they're not native most people think they are but they're not they're actually a species from the Pacific Northwest coast like Washington state out out there they have tons of western lupin species um, they've just they were introduced there in like in northern new england and not so much around here. You don't really see them, I guess, because they like the summer weather a little bit cooler. But, um, but these are actually a native um, native lupin. This is the wild. This is called sun, wild sundial lupin, and they like sand. Getting back to the sand, they 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 basically need like very very sandy soil. I think that you could probably plant them on a pile of sand. I think they'd probably be okay. Uh. <laughs> There's a species of butterfly um, that's on the verge of disappearing. Yeah, only the Carner's Blue Butterfly. Yeah, and every year the Butterfly Club goes to one part of the state that has them because the lupin. In Massachusetts, is, they yeah. There's, oh. some, there's some place that has the native lupin and yeah. has the Garner Blue. And it's, you know, it's a, I don't know if it's a secret, but it's like a big deal to go out and see them. Mm. So, I mean, some of these species, why are you using natives? Do you want to talk about that? Just like how they support. I'll tell you the main reason why I use native plants is well there's a few, a few there's probably the three main reasons number one I just think I'll tell you the truth I think they're a whole lot more interesting than the stuff you get and you go to the same the same six plants that everybody you know you, you go to a garden center and there's there's yews and there's euonymus and there's roses and there's daylilies and the same the same things um, another part of that is the fact that all those things, those ewes, those you know, hostas and daylilies, and st they don't really provide any value whatsoever to any wildlife. Any, they have like I, I'm my degree is in forest ecosystems, but it's basically forest ecology, and um, so I kind of tend to look at things as an ecologist more than I also have a lot of background in horticulture and in, uh, and you know, plant just plant science and things like that, but. Um, uh, I, I look at it from that, that, that standpoint as, a, uh, as an ecologist more than from, you know, the, the standpoint of like oh, what looks nice. I mean, but I like to make things that look nice, but this, is also, this also has like tremendous value to wildlife and native insects and everything. And the thing is like this type of, these species, like things like these wild lupins, they used to be all over the place, or they were a lot, they were probably a whole lot more common than they are today. And that's because they grow in places that have mostly been destroyed in very sandy pine pine barren type of, like uh, sand barrens basically sand plain grasslands and that type that type of thing where there's and they, and they need fire periodically um, those are places there aren't really too many left anymore so you know I look at it that I'm actually yeah I, I don't consider this rest or I'm not restoring anything because I, I I could bet my life that this was an you know basically a mixed oak forest I think for probably for millennia be before um, so I'm not you know this 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 is not a natural this isn't like some kind of uh, system where you can just leave it like this and it's just going to take care of itself the way a forest would it it needs you know you, you have to you have to weed out trees and there's always going to be invasive species like the bittersweet vines and things that the, you know there's some just regular weeds now and then but um, 
so they do need some maintenance, but the amount of maintenance that, that something like this need, this an area like this needs versus a lawn is is it's basically all you really need to do is just just chop, and you don't even need to. But the only the only thing that I do is just chop it down once a year. All the de the dead uh, the dead stalks in the early spring, or you can do it in the fall. Um, but I, I I like to leave it you know most of that the dead stalks up. Um, this is a monarch butterfly. Um, most people are familiar with I'm sure that's on orange butterfly weed there common milkweed purple milkweed is another um, orange butterfly weed another common milkweed and that's a and that one in the very bottom right is this, the ones that are that's a it's, it's called red milkweed or swamp milkweed and I have uh, some of those available there all of these are fed on all of these are monarch food if monarchs actually show up uh, that's all you can do you know um, I, not many people will use the one on the top left, and and also the one on the bottom, the third one on, uh, over on the on the bottom. Um, common milkweed. Very few people will use that in a garden um, because it spreads like crazy. Yeah. But uh, but I did. <laughs> I don't I, I don't recommend it necessarily. But um, I I. You know, something again. Not many people know about common milkweed, but it's actually a lot of a lot of that plant is actually edible. Um, you can't just eat it raw or anything, but you can use like the new shoots, like asparagus, the flower buds. You can you can eat them and all. I don't know if like there's there's a person named um, the he's the head. What is he? That he's basically in charge of the nursery at the garden in the woods, Dan Jaffe. Dan Jaffe. Yeah, and um, he, uh, he 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 does a great talk on wild edibles. That's that's and I just think that's one of the coolest things, but. Um, but there is a, that's that was what I was kind of thinking as sort of like a fail safe. So you want know, these things get a little too aggressive, you can you just eat them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I, I, I love I love the plant. I really like common milkweed. It, it, it's I know my, my mother for one hated it because there was like, I, I planted one, and it actually was like breaking up the edge of the driveway because <laughs> it was pushed. It, I guess it, I guess it found like a little thin spot in the in the asphalt and then, and, and it poked this way. So, you know, that really freaked her out and everything, but I really like it, and I'm even in spite of its aggressiveness. I love the, the fragrance. It's supposed to be the best, the best host for the monarchs, although I haven't, I haven't, ha I haven't had it in my garden. Dur like, the, the last monarch that I ever saw in my garden was before I ever had common milk. It was, it was eating, uh, it was actually um, eating butterfly weed. We have a uh, bumblebee survey at Brave Kill Conservation Land, and Professor Gagir, who's running it, and WPI is very, very fond of the common milkweed for the bumblebees, and um, it's a really, you know, it's a big pollinator plant. Mm. We planted it for the monarchs, and like you said, you know, we're happy to see one or two monarchs a year now, but it's a, still a great pollinator plant. Mm. I, I love the fragrance, and our kids love it in the fall because they have those those pods. Like the, the other milkweeds do this too, but those ones have those big, huge, puffy pods, and you, and the, you know, and the seeds fly all over the place. So they're really neat plants. I like them a lot. Just don't put them in a small space because they're not going to stay there. Um, that's a monarch. That's actually on the on butterfly weed. I'm, if, that may be the last monarch but caterpillar I saw in my my garden. I don't know. It's from a while back, I know that. But that's a uh, monarch caterpillar on orange butterfly weed. And then these are just a couple other. That's a, a black swallowtail, or there's a spice bush swallowtail, I think, on the top right, and that's on a mountain mint. And then a tiger swallowtail on purple coneflower. That's what our front yard used to look like. That's a list, real estate listing photo. With hostas planted in the sun. This is what it looks like now. Like I said, you know, I, I, I would, you don't need to get rid of all your lawn there's no there's, there's no I, I I'm not you know I actually um, am pretty fond of lawns in the I just feel like in the right place I think they're way overused I think they're just used as like I don't know what else to put. well there, 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 there's one thing is they say about lawn like mode you know, typical turf grass mowed lawn it's the cheapest thing to put in but it's the most expensive the, depending it's either the most expensive or the most time consuming depending whether you do it you do it, you know have someone else do it or you do it yourself to, to maintain of any other thing you can possibly grow, like there's, there's, you know, because of the constant need, you know, if nothing else, even if you, even if you do, you don't do anything, you still have to mow it every, you know, every week or so. Um, so anyway, this is this is what it is now, and um, 
so th th that little spot in there where the, the wood chips and the bench and the, and the, the, the little funny, funny looking planting in the middle, uh, that was our last little remaining part of the front lawn until last year. And then pretty much as soon as like June started, it was like totally brown, it was like totally brown, beige color the entire summer. Um, so um, I just decided, I just said, you know, after, after the summer was over, I just got rid of it all. And actually what I did with it is I dug out the, the second pond and back, all the stuff I dug out, I put on top of the grass and that, that, that works. You put enough, you put enough, you know, soil on top of it, it can't grow through it. So what, what did you plant in the middle of it? Um, that's, oh, that's Pennsylvania sedge. And that's, it's a native sedge, but it's a type of grass. And uh, I, I really like it a lot. As, uh, the New England Wildflower Society, it's a garden in the woods. They have a little demonstration plot where they created a little native, you know, native lawn using Pennsylvania sedge. It's a plant that you find all over out in the woods and everything. But it, it's amazing how that, like, that's a sunny spot there. And, uh, you know, usually they say to plant, you know, it needs to be in the shade. It'll tolerate bone dry like shade too. Like it, you know, it'll, it's it, and it'll stay green. It's not. It doesn't. It's not like it, it goes dormant like the Kentucky bluegrass and stuff. That stays green all, all through the season. It may not look like really lush and fantastic, but um, but I have that there in the sun, and I have a lot of other Pennsylvania sedge around in the sun here and there too, and it holds up really well. It sure holds up a lot better than any of the <laughs> the lawn grasses. Um, Will that fill in, or is that just? No, I just plugged that all in. That was just. Oh yeah, well yeah, it'll certainly yeah, it'll fill in. Yeah, pretty quick probably, probably by next year. Um, yeah, I just plugged all those in back a couple weeks ago, and then it has like the, the vegetable beds in the front there too. But um, I just couldn't. I couldn't leave that grass. I, I, see, the way I look at it is, see, there it is. This was last year, and this was probably pre this was pretty early on, I think, because there's still a little bit of green in that grass, but. Um, the way I look at it is like, what else could be there? And there's, cause there's, there's, there's so many other things that you can plant instead of a lawn. And you know, um, the, 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 the cost is an issue. I mean, cause if you're going to, if you're going to buy plant, you know, plants aren't cheap. Um, especially if you're going to buy a lot of them, but you can actually do seed, like seeded meadows too. And there's a whole, a whole, like, you know, uh, a lot of work going on in that in that area too, as far as exactly how to best do that. And there's all different seed mixes and stuff. But um, that can really be a good way of establishing like a, me uh, a native meadow in a sunny area. Um, they don't. It doesn't work so well for shaded shaded areas. Those you kind of want to use, pl uh, you know, small plants like that, or or you know, what they call pl real plugs, like small little little tiny plants. Then this is over on that on the other side. I got these vegetable beds, and well, I have a little herb garden I put in right. That's what that square bed is. It's just the very beginning of it last year. This was real early because the grass was real green. Oh, but um, and then in that one too, uh, you can see that's Pennsylvania sedge in back there. That whole row along the edge, and you can actually mow it too. You can, I mean, if if you know you don't need to, but if it's a little bit, you know, you don't like how tall it is. You can mow it just like you can mow regular grass. You know, you probably could, probably not going to hold up so well doing it every week. But then it doesn't, it doesn't grow fast enough to need to do that either. You know, you just can probably, you can mow it one, two, three times a season. And uh, the wood chips that you use around your beds here, are those like your, where do you get those? Those aren't, I mean, obviously it doesn't look like mulch. It looks yeah, like yeah, because, th th yeah, that was actually Thirty plus cubic yards of wood chips. It was one. Of, it was an uh, like a tree company. I talked to them. Uh, you know, they said, "Well, what we'll do. We'll get a good load of uh, conifer chips, and we'll, you know, we'll let you let you know, and we can we can bring it over." They, but they only do like full, ch not just a regular dump truck. This is like some extended yeah. dump truck. But yeah, yeah. I and it was like three hundred dollars for the whole or two hundred. I don't know what it was. It wasn't it, it wasn't much at all because if it was bark mulch, it would have cost a fortune. But I only use it on the paths, so that's um, that's something else I do. I, I don't I don't like continually apply mulch, and that's something that I think is way overused. Is, you know, it's just it's like this whole routine that landscapers go through. Where they you know they have the plants all spaced out, and every year you have to keep remulching it and everything. There's no reason to do you know if that's a whole kind of another story. But if you plant more densely, you don't need to do that. We use um, that same material for breakneck hills we have a pollinator which is flower yeah and first i thought we were going to mulch it was to keep the weeds down so they filled in mm -hmm. and i said well i don't want you know 
want that nice dark, you know, rich looking mulch. And he goes, Well, you know that's dyed. Yeah, it's I had no it idea. It's dyed. It goes down to the ground. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. we got this mulch. And Who knows what they dyed with? Right. I mean, it was like, I had no clue. I mean, it was like, Really? Yeah. So wood chips it was, and. Uh, yeah. And it's it's fine. You know, wood chips. I I mean, the only thing is, you know, they're kind of light colored, so right. you know, and then they're not and they're not like a nice perfect consistency. But they're, they're they're these are pretty you know pretty good ones. They're you know there aren't all kinds of you know weird sticks sticking out of things and stuff like that. So I had some stumps ground when I had a tree down, and they told me that I wanted to go use it as mulch. I'm like, it's beautiful. Yeah. And um, they said, well, don't put it close to your house because it's just going to attract all the insects. So. Yeah, I don't know. I it's away from my house, but... Yeah, I know. I mean, I've had pest people and just other people I've talked to, like arborists, that are like, they think it's crazy to have any dead... W I mean, but it's 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 the same. People put mulch up, you know, like the regular bark mulch. Well, it's all three different chemicals, right? Bark mulch? Well, not... I mean, that's what we, we were using that for a while, and it doesn't... Not necessarily. Some is and some isn't, but... Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't had any issues with. Uh, that's all I can say. I mean, I, I I'm a big fan of. <laughs> I'm a big fan of dead wood because there's so much stuff that lives in it and everything, and it's really good for you know just like out in the, in the woods. I mean, it's 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 a critical part of the forest. You know, the, all that the dead wood and everything. So, I mean, there was this this guy I was talking to, and he said, yeah, every single dead thing, dead piece of wood should be removed from you know, like with it, you know, from 500 feet away from your house or some crazy thing, and I'm. Uh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to choose to ignore that recommendation. Oh, these are two pe oh, there are two peach trees. I have a bunch of fruit trees. Um, these are two peaches that are absolutely loaded with peaches right now, as a matter of fact. Um, peaches are not native. No, my that's the that's where I I I focus on native and edible plants, and uh, uh, you know, for better or worse, most of our things that we eat are non-native species. So there's very, very few. There, well, like I was saying, with the milkweed, there are native edible things, but um, the, the the most well-known one is blueberries. The corn and squash are kind of you know not really native to the Northeast, but blueberries are though. I got a lot of blueberries, so I do have some native edibles. But uh, it's just. Can you go back one? <laughs> so, um, to the left of the, I guess that's one of your peach trees. What's that? That's like a plum, one? actually, that one there. The plum, the, so that, like, frothy plant. That that's plum. asparagus. Oh, it is? Yeah. I, wa I thought it might be. I love asparagus. It's, I, I love perennial vegetables, perennial edible things in, in general. And that's yeah, that's what it looks like when you, once you stop, you stop uh, cutting it and just let it go for the summer. Yeah. There's still some growing at Breakneck Hill from yes. many years ago. Yeah. yeah, it's a tough plant. It, once it gets established, I think it's got to be one. I've, I haven't tried to kill it, but I imagine it's pretty hard to kill. <laughs> well, for one thing is when you plant it, you plant it so far. There's a whole thing. You plant the roots way down, and then gradually you, like, fill it in. So the, ro the roots it's are really... It's a mound, right? Don't you have to do yeah, eventually once you yeah, get up to the, the up to the top, yeah. So it, it, it's got to have a crazy... I mean, and, and that, you know, asparagus... The whole whole summer, whole summer with no with no watering in the drought, and it was fine. So were the fruit trees. And, it, and that is or isn't native asparagus. None of those. No. It's no. Just edible. Um, edible. Yeah. Just check it. Okay. There's a lot of people. There's people who say, oh, I, I, every, I just only grow na in native things, and, and I mean that's that's fine. But I just figure, you know, everybody has to eat. I mean that's one thing we all have to eat, and uh, the food comes from somewhere. Everything you eat, you have, it's, 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 you know, ultimately it's all grown somewhere on the same planet. So I just, I figure that the lowest impact way to eat is to grow stuff, you know, organically yourself, right, you know, within walking distance. So <clears throat> we get a lot of food out of the garden. And those potatoes. I just threw in a few of these. Oh, this is, this is a neat one, though. This is um, called Jerusalem artichoke, which probably some people are familiar with. It's also called sunchoke. And it's actually an ed it's it has edible tubers, and it's actually a sun. It's botanically, it's actually a species of uh, sunflower, um, which the flowers kind of give away. But um, this this is another. It's basically a perennial vegetable. I mean, it's it's you know you you remove the tubers, but you always. What I've read, and certainly what I can attest to, is that there's always some that get left behind in the. 
<laughs> whenever you go to harvest them, and they're just going to keep on growing back, and it's probably there's probably no way to kill it, but um, because <laughs> it is, it is amazingly uh, productive. Um, I mean, I just planted this stuff for the first time last year, and we, I don't know, 20 pounds easily, and I didn't even harvest like the whole the whole. What does it taste like? Yeah. It's a lot. Well, what did we do with it? With the oh, I can't. Tomato -ish? It's a it's a it's sort of like a kind of potato like. So we there was some recipe we found. I forget what it was, but it's it's a lot like a potato. Like the the the, cons the texture consistency is kind of potato like, but it's got like a like a nutty ish kind of kind of flavor. Um, it's pretty good. It's just that it's kind of hard to like prepare because the roots are you know the tubers are all knotty and stuff. So it's a little bit a little bit of work, but. Because yeah, I think you, I don't know, maybe you can leave the skins on, but whatever it was that we did with them, the things we did, you're supposed to take them off. But, but um, it, 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 it's a very nice looking plant. It gets like eight feet tall. <laughs> so <laughs> The Dutch survived on that during 1944, that bad winter. Yeah. So a lot of them don't eat it anymore because <laughs> 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 the ones went through it. <laughs> <laughs> This is just a path through the front. This was all, everything in this photo was grass just a few years earlier. And I, I like this one also because it's, it's a mix, well, oh, actually, um, this is short tooth mountain mint, the plant in the very bottom left. It's, it doesn't really matter. It's just, just think of it as mountain mint. Um, I don't think it really matters. This, this species, I don't think are really, you know, I mean, there's, there's I, have, I think I have like five different species in my garden, but they all, though, are absolutely, if, if you, people are always, talking about pollinators now and bees and all this type of thing. Those, those are the biggest pollinator attractant that I think that we have in this. It is unbelievable, the amount of like, and, and they flower for a long, they're very, very small, insignificant. It's kind of like a, a, well, it's called mountain mint. It's not, a, it's not technically a mint, but it's, it smells minty. It looks, it's in the mint family. Um, it's, it's certainly, you know, looks, looks and smells like a mint, but it, um, it has very tiny, tiny little flowers. And just for some reason, like, I guess they're just loaded with nectar or something. These little flowers are just covered in pollinators. And the plant, that's wild bergamot next to it too, the pink one over there, there. Some of those have self-seeded in, but this path is, it, it, it's, not, it's not this narrow, it's just, I think it's just the perspective. It's, you can actually walk through there pretty comfortably. It looks like it would be, you know, like a squeeze through there. But uh, uh, wild bergamot also is a, is a huge pollinator plant, just an absolute, it's a, it's a bee bomb. It's it, like people know that the red, the scarlet bee balm. It's in the same genus, but it's a different species. And the, the bee balm gets powdery mildew, and it kind of likes to be in pretty moist areas. This stuff does just fine, and it's sort of like the dry land uh, counterpart of the scarlet. The scarlet, and, and there's a lot. Of, a lot of the ones you see in the garden centers and and all that are actually hybrids. Like there's all these different colors that are different. You know, all kinds of different magentas and all this kind of thing that. They, I think they make those usually by hybridizing this species and the red one. I don't, I'm not, I don't know that. For there, maybe there's another species that goes in the mix too. I don't know. But uh, that is actually Brussels sprouts in the bottom right there, and a peach tree. So I just, I just like this photo because it kind of mixes the, you know, it's like usually the vegetable gardens like set aside over there, and you know, the rectangular shape way out in the back, and the flower gardens over here. I, 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 I like to kind of mix it together like that. What do you use in your pathways? Um, what do you use for the paths? Do you use the chips again? Just wood chips, yeah. And to keep the weeds off? It works great for keeping out the weeds, yeah. And it, I think it also, I mean, just like any mulch, it's also going to help to protect the, the soil life, too. Because obviously every time, you know, you're compacting the soil, you're, you know, you're damaging that, so. Um, trim the paths, too. Do you have to kind of trim? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that would just be just completely impenetrable if I <laughs> didn't. I wondered about ticks too. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people have been talking about ticks. And uh, I, I mean, I have two young kids, one's four and one's seven, and they're both, they're outside all the time. Like, like I mean, we, they, they love being out, outdoors playing on their own, first of all. And then whenever they're not, we're kind of usually pushing them out anyway. So they're, 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 they're outside all the time. and they. Even like this this year, I've I've had I had a couple ticks on me yesterday, I think. But I mean that that recent, I get them I get them pretty pretty often. But that's from you know kind of going around more in the you know, out in the bushes and everything. And the kids very I, very rarely. I mean we've 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 had them on hikes, like when we've gone out to, like some of the different natural areas near us and everything. Um, but in the yard, I don't think they've ever even gotten any. And th they 
they spend a lot of time. They love running around these paths and stuff. And we have a, a, some lawn area in back. And I, I've gotten ticks on me from the lawn, too. So I know, like, they're, they're in the grass, too, just the same. Because I was like, usually, I said, there's no way. I, I haven't even, they're going to tick on me. There's no way I, this thing came. It, came, it must have come from the yard. I just did it from the lawn. I couldn't believe it. But uh, anyway, um, you know, I, 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 don't know, I don't know what ticks. I mean, our kids know to check for them, and we, we check for them. And, um, I haven't, yeah, that really done anything to. But one thing is, we don't have deer that much either. You know, they're they're around. They come around now and then. We've definitely seen them, but um, but I've actually had deer, seen deer ticks too. This is a stream and back. So we have this bit of grass still. This has actually been like trimmed down a little bit because that's something I'm always. <laughs> that's something I kind of do do a lot is where I go. When I go to edge the grass, I like move it in if I you know, a few feet or something, or you know way. <laughs> 20 feet or whatever and just strip it all right off because I don't again like I don't necessarily recommend it to everybody but the way I got rid of all the grass in our yard like almost all of it was just with a flat bladed shovel just scraping it off and you just I just cut strips and then just scrape it off and you, you, you can't like if it if it holds together well enough you can kind of just roll it up just like carpet but um, I'm you know that's if you know so that's if you want to transplant it or something me I'm just always trying to get rid of it so I I like beat it all as much as I can to get all the soil off it and then just compost it and back. But um, that's purple flowering raspberry there all along that edge, which is a, a really nice native shrub. The one, everything has its little caveats, and the one with that one is that, like the, not, not to the degree of common milkweed, but it will spread. It'll really spread. So, you know, that's not something you can keep in a little contained area, but it's a great plant for the right place. <coughs> This was just grass in t t uh, 09, and this was, no, oh, this was just the other day. Yeah, I took this from out in front of our neighbor's yard. It's like three paper birches, arrowwoods, um, which is a type of viburnum, and then hay scented fern on the, on the ground there. So I kind of, it's like 10 feet wide. It's basically like, this is the neighbor's yard and our driveway, and there's like this strip that's about 10 feet wide, and I don't know how long the driveway is, whatever, 100 feet or something. But, um, I, and, and again, like I did it in sections. I planted the three trees first, and I just put them in, and I just cut out a circle of grass. Then the next year, I put in the shrubs in between them, these arrowwoods, and they were just small little things, too. Um, and then I think what, then, then, then it's, I just did it really gradually. And then, like, the next year, I'd go in, like, you know, the, the things would grow, so they need more room, so I'd cut more grass out. And then the year or two after that, I just got rid of all the rest of the grass. And mixed. The funny thing with this was this was under this was like basically a chemically treated typical lawn for I don't know how many years, decades. The soil under there was basically just like gray powder. I'd never seen anything like it, and uh, there was no worms, there was no nothing in there. It was just looked like gray sand, like it was just drain of any. You know, the, the grass on top. Of this this is new people moved in, and they're not doing all the chem lawn every week and stuff, but. Um, the grass was like totally lush and green and looked great, but underneath it, it was just just dead, you know. And now, I mean, most of the the lawn has pretty much died, and it's all weeds now because it's off of life support, <laughs> the chemi chemical life support. But I mixed in probably like two or three cubic yards of compost in this area, and the the trees are, you know, after I stripped off the grass, and now there's worms and there's all kinds of life in there and stuff, and the soil functions kind of like a sponge. Water runs off the drive. Again, no water last year. Everything did, you know, did fine. But it's along the driveway too. So even just those little tiny, tin little sprinkles that we, you, you'd get, we got last year, like now and then, it would run. Off, it would run off the, the pavement, and some water would, you know, pretty much everything that goes into that soaks into the ground because it's so the soil is so spongy now. Um, and that's a plant. That another one. It's not really, you know, the, the fern there. It's called hay scented fern, and um, it's a very, very aggressive spreader. But it also it's a fern that grows well in the sun, in dry sun, and I don't think there, there's there's har hardly any other ferns that that will do that will do what the, you know that will thrive in the conditions that this one will, and uh, it, it's doing really well there. And it's basically confined by a driveway, by a road, by mowed grass. So when it's when it's hemmed in like that, it's not you know. But you, it's it's like another one. You don't want to just plant it with all your other little plants because it's gonna kill them all in short order um, anything you know but but it does it does fine with the shrubs and with and there's actually a whole bunch of asters and co wild columbines and stuff along the side of the driveway this is just a when you go back to um you don't have to go back to the shop but 
with your neighbors with their lawns and you're right next door. Mm -hmm. Do you get any feedback or comments? No, or not really. No, protests I mean, or. But again, I did it all. I, I didn't just like come in and just like you know just you know bulldoze the whole yard and like do it all, <laughs> do it all immediately. I did it gradually over the years and. No, it's I mean, so attractive. It's not like you just yeah yeah let it go. Right. No, I look at it as like I don't have. Really, I mean, there's a few here and there, but I don't really have weeds. You know, I mean, there aren't even like it's not like it's not like people think you can just stop mowing your lawn and just it's just going to return to nature and stuff. Like, no, it's not. It's just going to be weeds, and then if you let it go long enough, it's going to be full of bittersweet and buckthorn and all this and all this tree of heaven and all this junk that's going to come in there and honeysuckles and every, and multiflora rose and everything else. So, like the way I look at it is this: I look at it that. I mean, obviously, all of us, we depend on nature for our lives. I mean, for, you know, the air and water and, and uh, food and everything. But really, nature really depends on us now, too, is what I, I mean. This thing is like you're, you think, oh, you know, all these things can live out in the, out in the wild and whatever. We, you know, why do we need to worry about, you know, providing habitat in our yards? But the thing is, is that the, the, the wild, so much of it now is just destroyed by, and, and, I mean, what's left is just destroyed by invasive species in so many cases like you look at you know besides all the you know all the ash trees are all dead and i mean around us they're, they're all just like wiped out and, and and hemlocks and so many different you know um different species like that and then underneath them is you, you know it looks like a bunch of green stuff from a distance but up close you see, there's there's nothing native in there sometimes i mean you know or sometimes there's, there's very little and it's just um invasive species that really don't provide, you know, they don't provide what our native wildlife needs uh, is what it comes down to. I mean, you know, they feed some birds and things like that. So, you know, the things like the honeysuckles and the, ro the wild, those multiflora roses and stuff. But, you know, that's around for a short period and then, that, and then that's it. And then they're, then they're gone. The rest, they're, they're not feeding insects or anything like that. So that's a white water lily in the pond. Yeah. Um. So I, I think I have some glossy buckthorn, but as far as like invasives in general, how did you control yours? I just pull, well, pull them out. Um, what you, you have the advantage on, on a, you know, typical house lot size kind of property. You have the advantage of like being there. So um, a lot of things might be pretty hard to kill. But, you know, m m you know, glossy buckthorn is one of those where you cut it down, and as you give it a week, it's going to be, you know, especially this time of year, it's going to be sprouting right back. And if you let it go a whole season, it'll be six feet tall and everything. But um, you have the advantage, though, where you know you cut it, and then it sprouts back, and then you cut it again, and it sprouts, you know, or you just break off the, you know, the, the, the sprouts, and two or three go rounds with that, and it's going to die. Like there, there's there's very few things that. There are plants that take, you know, a lot more of a battle to take years to, to, to get rid of, but um, but those type of things like that, those shrubs and trees for the most part, you know, they have they have a lot of stored energy in their roots, so you cut them off and they can grow back from that. But if you keep on, you do that like pretty much within one season, you're you're going to kill it, you know. So you don't you don't the the point being like if it's some kind of you know conservation land that's 100 acres or something like that, then. You know, usually the things are cut and they're treated with herbicide, but you, you know, there's not really a need to. There's not really re really a reason to do that with like a you know, smaller size property. Um, but you know, like I said, some 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 kinds of plants though are a whole different story. But but buckthorn though is um, see, it's not that hard. This is uh, I you know you don't think of grasses like grass is having beautiful flowers, but this this one just really like this is called Indian grass. It's a native prairie. It used to grow all over the, the Midwestern prairie. It's one of the main components of the original tall grass prairie. That's all pretty much gone now. But it's also native to all through all up through the Northeast as well. And uh, it's a pretty tall grass. It gets like about six feet tall, but it has not really nice flowers. It's good for like in back, you know. You you don't want it like too close. This is a, a native rose, Virginia rose. That right now it's flowering right now, and it, and and you can hear from across the street. You can hear the bees on this thing. I'm not even like exaggerating. And you can smell it too. It's it's it's, it's a really nice fragrance, but again, a spreader. <laughs> well, I think that's that's a, that's a, it seems to be kind of a theme with a lot of native plants. But but that's part of what makes them so resilient though too, and and so and so tough and able to withstand so many things. That, planting things together also kind of helps to control some of that ferociousness that you know if you plant something and it's just like got a sea of mulch or soil all around it 
you know, it's going to fill that up pretty quick versus when it's competing with a lot of other things. This is wild columbine. Wild, uh, what's the uh, cardinal flower? These are just a few. I just did a few flower photos. This is the butterfly weed with a with a bee. Oh, that's a honey bee. Non-native honey bee. These are a few, just a few, three native grasses that I, I just I made this thing last year. This little collage, Indian grass. That's little blue stem on the top right, and then that's switch grass on the bottom right. And those are like the, probably the three native grasses that I use the most in the sun. Those are all sun, definitely sun lovers. There's the uh, butterfly weed, New Jersey tea. This is Golden Alexanders. This is actually in my front yard. <laughs> It looks like it's some kind of wild meadow, but there's actually a street right there. <laughs> so does this spread? Through? It does, but it spreads by seed. Yeah, it self-seeds like crazy. And I'm kind of wondering how, how it's going to do now with this interface, because it's, it's spreading, but it has a lot of tough competition, too, so I don't know how Is that the heart leak? No, that's the right. I have that, too. Um, there's two different species. Like this is the, it has these more, like, pin eight kind of, this is the regular Golden Alexanders. It's a uh, host plant for the... Black swallowtail, yeah. I find it. I find the black swallow. Yeah, I haven't been any yet this year. I haven't seen any, but I have. I find they like the heartleaf golden alexanders a lot more. But yeah, this is supposed to. It's in the carrot family, so car carrots and, and dill and parsley, all that stuff is in that same. Those are all hosts for that black swallowtail, which is a beautiful butterfly. This is the prickly pear cactus, native cactus. Likes it dry. <laughs> That's, this is just another shrub I really like. It's called gray dogwood, and uh, it spreads a bit, but it's not 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 like not like crazy. It gets like six or eight feet tall, and it's just flowering like mad this year. Pollinators all over it. It has white berries that are really neat. Like, and this thing's I can't even imagine. Like, this thing's gonna. It, I've never seen one flowering like this before. It's really enjoying all the rain or something, I guess. And then it's gonna have a ton of fruits on it. It's a native shrub dogwood. This is um, purple flowering raspberry. Edible fruits on that's another wild edible. Um, this is a photo everybody always really seems to like. And these are these this is everything in this photo is self seeded, <laughs> by the way. That's called fireworks gold. It's a, it's it's a cultivar. It's a goldenrod. It's called fireworks. This this particular goldenrod cultivar. This one grew by seed, and usually like cultivars are you know when they. The, the seeds that come up from those aren't going to be that similar, you know, necessarily that similar. They have the same characteristics, but this one has that beautiful arching kind of flowering. And then that's a New England aster, and that's white snake root with the white flowers. So, and all these things, this is all growing in there in that hay scented fern on the edge of the driveway. <laughs> they all just grew in there, and this was last year in the drought. This is little blue stem, probably my favorite grass. And this is this is a, a fall shot of like what you know I just have a few of these kind of things like I, I, I that's one thing I love about what I've what, what I've put together here is how it changes through all the seasons and even just the flowering it's you know it, it, you think like with all these different things it's going to look like a like a big mess like with all different colors but they're all so many different you know like things like the New, New Jersey tea and the butterfly weed will flower at the same time the orange and the white but um, a lot of these others, it's like they take turns kind of. There's one, you know, and they're all over the place. There's like one thing flowering and then another one and another one. And a lot of them are kind of like they're spaced out like that. And, but in the fall, too, I, th I think it's really beautiful, too. And in the winter, this is, um, this is wild bergamot. I th or is it, or is it, uh, no, actually it's uh, mountain mint, I think. They kind of have similar looking seed heads. They look those round. Uh, Little dry, dried out round balls like that in the winter. Um, and then I just did, a few, I'll just go through. I just did a few of these. I put them in here. I don't know how much time we have, but oh, I guess we, I guess it's till 8 30. Yeah, so it's 8 08, and we've been asking questions as we go along, so I don't think I need to stop them to wait for questions and answers. So if you have questions, ask them and go right to 8 30. Okay. Is that okay with everyone? Sure. So yell out your questions if you have been holding Yeah, feel free. I'm oh. I, I love questions. Um, so this is uh, wild columbine, golden alexanders. That's wild geranium in the top right, which I love. That self-seeds all over the place. It's, it's 
flowers pretty early, so there's not much else at that same time. Um, that's black chokeberry on the bottom right. And wild lupin, the native wild lupin, which I just absolutely love these things. They flower for a long time, too. Unfortunately, I don't think we have any Carner's blue butterflies around in Essex County, but um, these are some of the buds. These are all from my garden. Uh, Monarch, that's a great spangled fritillary in the top right. Tiger swallowtail. That is, with the red spotted purple, I think, in the bottom right. This is a peck skipper. That's, a, and that's actually a tiny butterfly, but I, I, I enlarged it. It's on, that's on a liatris. Which that's just like one of the one of the little flower clusters on the you know the Leatris has those has a, the it's called Blazing Star it has those spikes, and I actually have the native the New England Blazing Star that, that may be I, I don't know I have a few different species but um, it's a you know nice look pretty little butterfly and then that's a I think it's a spice bush swallowtail on the mountain mint I think it, it's it's missing part it's missing those two uh, those tails basically <laughs> but that thing hung around for a long time that. Uh, these are all these are all asters or aster aster, just some just some different. These are all just different flowers from around around the garden. Was the yellow one the popular? The yellow one is on the on the right or the left. On the, right. the right is a is a prickly pear. Oh, the prickly pear. Yeah, which has they have huge beautiful. I mean, it's amazing that that plant isn't. And all you need to do is you just take off a pad and you stick it in the ground. In, in the, the, the requirement being that it's got very, very good drainage and lots of sun. But other than that, um, it's just a really beautiful The other plant. yellow flower someone was asking. The other one is called uh, Sundrops. It's uh, Oenothera um, fruticosa. Just some wildlife. And this is all just more butterflies with the frog, too. <laughs> that's a, a self-seeded. I, I, that's actually one I think that's uh, I think it's a hybrid black-eyed Susan. That, that I think there's there was a gar it was a garden plant that the previous owner had, and they just pop up here and there. But it's basically a, a, a black-eyed Susan. That thing was just spectacular. And the, the white in the lower left was that. Uh, that's New Jersey tea, with uh, some kind of pollinating wasp on it. Yeah. Oh, and that's elderberry in the middle, the top middle. And that I think is, I think purple milkweed is a state listed threatened species, right? Uh, I think. Asclepias purpurescens. <clears throat> this is our second pond. <laughs> the kids helping. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it, so. Well, thank you very yeah. much. So, do we have any questions? I have a question about rabbits. Do you have problems? Yeah, I, I've had yeah, d just huge frustration with, <laughs> with rabbits. Yeah, I have daylilies and my flowers are just chewed up. Oh, I get. Yeah, yeah, deer, are, deer are tough, and there's something that I don't really have to deal with. To, for some reason, I, I don't know. May, you never know what's may, maybe they're, maybe it's going to get bad down the road. <laughs> you know, they're going to say. Because like for the first few years we lived, I mean, I never saw any deer around, and then the last. Sometimes you don't see them during the day, though, not a lot of the night. Yeah. Because I have the candy tuft. It's truly candy for them. <laughs> <laughs> they constantly yeah. Candy yeah, I don't know what. Yeah, but deer are a tough issue. But with rabbits, though, um, you know, the, the funniest thing was I used to have. I I, try, I was planting asters. I wanted, you know, I have smooth aster, New England aster. And I, pl I planted, I don't know, half a dozen or something, and they all got eaten to the, uh, to the ground. And, and, and uh, I, I swear, I think one time, I think I saw, a I, I got to know, like, what? Asters. And I looked it up online. I'm like, nothing I could find. Rabbits? Nothing about rabbits and asters. Um, but they just kept mowing them down. And then, you know, you know what the thing was, was the first time one of them actually got the flower and produced seed, and then the, the <laughs> There was a thousand seeds everywhere. There was asters all over the place, and now they they can't keep up. Basically, I have you know I have asters all around. So I don't know what the what the lesson from that is, but it's you have a good quantity of flowers, so the fuel is missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just you have to. 
it's just going to lead to frustration being too attached to any. The, 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 the biggest thing was with the vegetables. Like, they just ate all the peas. I'm like, come, come on, really? They haven't done that before. <laughs> They're just all stumps now. And, you know, they were all, like, chewing them all down. Like, so I, I guess you can fence them in. I have, I have a few garden beds that have, like, you know, vegetable beds that have fence, fencing around them. But not that one because they haven't never, they never bothered the peas before. But... But and um, Richard, you also have a company and a website, NativeScapesMassMA.com. Yes. So that's something you can look up, and if you're ever looking for a consultant or. Uh, you know. Do you have any recommendations for shade? Oh, there's tons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it de again, it, it depends on specifics, like, you know, how how much is it you know full shade or is it some you know a little bit of sun and, and then also like the moisture conditions um, you usually for us like unless it's unless it's done you know uh, hit with sprinklers shady areas are tend to be pretty dry uh, you know for the most part and uh, there's um, like as far as like shrubs or um, I mean there's these beautiful you know plant uh, you know flowering flowers and things but you've got a very shady corner or mm -hmm. back area it's just like what can you put there that'll just live without water and yeah just look nice well the the, the my, my go-to's are always uh well sedges basically for the most mostly pennsylvania sedge and ferns christmas fern is, is an evergreen fern and it's amazingly um really surprisingly drought tolerant like it'll it'll a lot more than you think especially with a lot of organic matter it'll it'll live in the sun it, it can be a lot more resilient than than you than you'd think. Um, white wood aster is a great one. Rot, is so, you know really super durable and. What about foam flower? I don't really have a lot of experience with that's um, Tyrella cordifolia. Um, I don't know I, I know that that's like one of the you know re, re, really like dry shade tolerant plants or tends to kind of need. I know I don't. You don't. I know. It, I, I don't think this is part. Of, if it is, it's, it's not something you see in the woods around here that much. I mean, it's certainly not in the usual like oak, blueberry kind of. You know, I, I think if it does grow around here, it must be in more. You know, better so You know, the more moist like kind of place, kind of the forest they have out in, in Western Mass, like a little more. But um, yeah, I haven't really used that one that much. But it's a, it's a nice plant though. Have you have you you have? Have you used it? It's it's just pretty. Yeah. No, it is. Yeah. Foam flower. Wild columbine does great in the, in the shade. Uh, you know, we, depending on the how on the degree of shade, but uh, may apple. This is some of the like uh, native uh, may apple and wild gin, wild ginger. Um, trillium. Uh, trillium's not a really tough plant. I mean, it's it, it it's it's shade tolerant. It'll and it grows in the woods, but it's hard to grow. Um, and it's something that it's more for like the the, the wood, woodland garden type of type of area where you know um, people grow you know you, you the garden in the woods sells them like uh, uh, some of the like native lady slipper orchids and things like that too I mean those aren't they're not easy to grow but um, you know you need specific type of conditions and everything but things like the wild columbine ferns sedges uh, white wood aster are just and a wild ginger are just T amazingly resilient, yeah. They'll, they'll, they, you know, everything needs water to get established, though. That's, a th you, you know, you, you do need to take care of them in the beginning. Once they're established, you know, and they they take care of themselves. What type of blueberry do you grow? Um, well, the, the, there's there's high bush blueberries, which are the you know they get six or eight or whatever, however tall you know taller than that in time. Um, and then there's low bush blueberries that only get like six or six or twelve inches tall. That, you know, um, I have both of those. I've, are they I, uh, both native? Yeah, they both are. They're both native. Yeah, you'll find them both out in the woods. Um, a lot of the high bush blueberries that you, you, are offered for sale are usually a, a, a certain selection. And they have you know Patriot and Early Blue and uh, I don't know, you know, just some Jersey something or other um, that. Uh, but they're still hybrids. They're still the same species, but they're just they're propagated from cuttings or whatever, so they're all identical. Do you have trouble with the birds? No, I. I w the thing is, birds provide a lot of. I, mean, not, I don't know how how significant it is, but they actually provide a lot of pest control services. So they, that, that most of what they eat is insects. So, um, you know, I mean, 
We don't really get them bothering us, really. I mean, um, you know, granted, I don't have a wheat field or something either. I don't know if, we, or, you know, something that they would, you know, really. You're, you actually get to harvest your berries without netting them? Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the birds get some, but I probably have 20. I mean, I just tuck them in all over the place. Like, I've just kind of added them here and there, and we probably have 20 highbush blueberries. No, the thing with the highbush blueberries, though, was the... Uh, the winter moth until like I have I've got four yeah. high bushes in the oh. yard and I haven't had a blueberry in three years. Yeah. This, this year, year I finally am seeing yeah. some there. Yeah, us too, us yeah. too. Yeah, and those because I used to harvest like thirty pounds of these. Mm. Right, right. I know it's just and, and you know you, it's so it's so like heartbreaking. You go and you look at as soon as the oh look the the buds are opening up and they're starting to, and then you see you can see the tiny tiny little caterpillars eating the flowers like before they're even oh uh, come on you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, as soon as, and then, and then they're just like skeletons, and then they have to, they have to grow back and all that. But I don't know. Knock on with it. This year, winter moth. These, these pest populations are all over the place. There's gypsy moth, all, you know, here and there. And there's all these outbreaks and different, you know, populations are very cyclical, and they're, you know, they're, they're, it's different from one, you know, part of town to another and stuff. So, uh, but I'm just, I'm just grateful that <laughs> winter moth is kind of leaving them alone this year, at least. You hope that. It's going to be controlled at some point, but um, yeah, no. I it, blueberries are um, are a great replacement for um, some of the common invasive species like burning bush. Is you can you I can get rid of that because it's all in the woods around me. Yeah. And my husband went in and took out tons of it. Yeah. But I think it's just going to come back. Right, right. And, and that's and that's where you know a lot of people don't like chemicals and herbicides, but that's where you know. And that, depending on the situation, you cut it and then you, you, you like what, I have a little applicator. It's just like a, like a, um, like a tube with like a foam thing on the end and you just get the stump and, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm as, I'm as anti, you know, pesticides as anybody, but, you know, there are, there are cases where sometimes it's the thing to do. Excuse me, is that what you do about poison ivy? Um, well, I don't really deal with, but, <laughs> Poison ivy is a native plant, I and mean, it's not something you want in your necessarily want in your garden, right? You know, right by your front entryway to your house or something like that. But it's a native plant, and it's very valuable to wildlife. Um, that being said, like you know, I'd put on disposable gloves and 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 cut it, you know. I know, but even that, some people can't yeah. even get near. Yeah, well, you got to find somebody who can, I guess, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and lift somebody's. Uh, uh, help with that, you know. But I want to just say a couple of things about the native plants. Of, you know what? Just I think most people here are kind of already on board. But if if you don't quite get what it's about, you know, for our native species, um, in that book I was talking about, Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home. He talked about going, and he had grad students, and I think in Seattle is like the green city of the country, and they had all these wonderful um, trees they planted everywhere, but they weren't native, and they went and they checked, and there were like no insects. And you know, our birds need insects to live. So like, you're, you're planting all these greenery, and yes, maybe it was pretty, and it helped with the pollution or you know, creating air, but no insects. It's, you know, you need insects to feed you know, it's like everyone wants to get rid of insects, but they're really such an important component of, you know, these birds that fly, you know, from uh, South America and they get here and then there's no insects for them to eat. And even seed-eating birds feed their babies caterpillars and insects. And so you have to have it. Another story I heard was about um, at the Mass Butterfly Club, one of the species of butterflies that's declining is checkers, Baltimore checkers fly. Right, but they don't have a very long flight area. So, like, if their their plant host plant or their habitat gets wiped out, they need to hop to the next one. And that's why, like, we have say in town Breakneck Hill Conservation Land. If there's we have a we have a population there, but if something happened there, they need to hop skip to the next place. Especially with like climate change happening, they need it to be close by, and your backyard can be that place. You know. Your backyard can be the place where these pollinators are finding a safety zone till they go to the next one to the next, and then maybe they end up, you know, especially with the northward movement that our southern, um, you know, not just birds but caterpillars and other insects and our pollinators. So I just wanted to kind of say that was sort of a big focus here is like what you're doing in your own yard has a global impact, even though it's just 
even just one plant. You don't yeah, have to definitely. do the whole thing here, but how beautiful yeah. was that? I mean, yeah, even just one shrub or one tree is, is you know, Your yard is certainly inspirational. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I didn't want to interrupt if there were more questions, but I just wanted to give a plug for just planting one native plant in your yard can make a difference. And, um, Doug yeah. Tallamy's favorite thing is oaks, but it just oaks. I look around. We have so many oh. oaks, but oaks, oaks are nice trees. They're great They're trees. They're great but trees, but we um, sure have a lot in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> I was driving down today though, and I I, I, was, I was thinking, well, look at that. It's all like it's all oaks, and this one that's all, all you can see. You know, I don't know, you know, good sized trees, but and then down a little further, like, like Marlboro. Um, it, it looked like winter almost, except for some green things underneath. I guess it, it must be gypsy moth. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 too, I guess. Big infestation. It was just everything. Year, the, the pine trees and everything was all Everything was defoliated. Yeah. The just problem is, you know, the balance there. Like if you people want to spray for the gypsy moths, but then you're killing all the other caterpillars. I heard someone say, oh, and don't the predators spray. and the parasites and stuff. And don't those spray are the your that don't spray your flowering plants so you don't want to kill the pollinators. And I'm like. Most of them start out as caterpillars, and, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's always the balance. But you know, in a few years, they say the uh, next year the fungus should be back again, and they're actually doing a similar thing for the winter moths. Mm -hmm. There's a parasite from Canada that they're introducing, little by little. First, they had to make sure it was really not going to impact anything else, and um, so they they are starting to introduce it, and it, it may start to work on that. But you also had mentioned the Bradford pear. Go down any of these subdivisions, oh, the no. favorite little subdivision mm. tree, you know, it's not too big and it's pretty. They supposedly not invasive and they're sterile, except for they somehow they're breeding with some other native plants. Well, no, what they're doing native. is like one variety might be sterile, you know, like the original Bradford pear. But then they developed another variety that yeah, has a little different shape or something, you know, it's m more narrow or more whatever. And, uh, and then so then, as soon as those started, you know, being in proximity, then they cross pollinate, and then you get fruits. And, <laughs> and I've seen whole fields full of them. Yeah. Know, like an abandoned lot next to a subdivision, just completely full. So they are probably soon to be listed as invasive. So it's one of the things, you know, um, we're doing a tree planting uh, program. Sorry. Uh, this, the town has like what trees are appropriate to be planted. And I'm like, go native. Like, there's no reason not to. You can find a native like substitute a for almost every plant yeah. there is. So. There's some of the really extreme urban sites, so sometimes, I mean, things like ginkgos and some of these kinds of things can, you know, can be, you know, sometimes, sometimes you know, the, the, the best option, but pretty much like any suburban type kind of uh, environment, it's, uh, you know, that's a different story. You know, I usually have conditions that bad as those urban street tree conditions. Mm -hmm. So, he recommended Noah's Garden. I haven't read it yet, but and you said it's out of print, so the fact our library. I don't know. I'm not sure. I know that this one, because when I, I I own them both. I know when I went to buy that one, that that one I had to get second. You know, I had to get it used because it was out of print. I can't remember. I've had I've had Noah's Garden for so many years. That I can't. I, I don't know. But that book totally changed my life. But way and years planting ago. Noah's Garden. And why I'm, I'm making a, a big deal about this is because you go through the gardening areas and sometimes you can find a book that's about going organic or planting native and they might be native like all of, all of America, like um, which aren't necessarily, you want to go as close to your hometown as possible. Well, Sarah Stein with this, this book was so just eye-opening to me because it, she, her whole focus is is sort of on like is on what she did with her with some property that she she's passed passed away you know some year, a few years ago but um, when she you know started her you know got some land and she started making a garden and all this and it, and, and and looking at the approach from like plant communities and like and basically putting back like with the, with the 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 thought t towards putting back what was there you know years ago before everything was you know so you know radically changed and all that and the forests were cleared and everything and all this type of thing and uh, and just sort of like what you know how, how that all worked for but it was it was really revolutionary I think when when she when she wrote this book um, then like what Freddie had mentioned about Doug Tallamy's book bringing nature home sort of really f narrows the focus a little bit sort of on l looking at, at um, insects as a good thing <laughs> you know in general like when 
plants, I mean, insects eating plants is, is, is good, and that's, and that's because that, what that means, I mean, f usually, <laughs> not with winter, with winter moth, it's not good, and gypsy moth, it's also not good, but when, when it's, when it's, na <laughs> but those things, you know, those are, those are, those are invasive pest outbreaks, you know, that's a whole different thing, but native insects, though, um, they will, they are what support most of our native birds, and, uh, and just looking, just looking at things that way, they're like you're planting plants, like not not for the berries, not for the flowers, and the, but for their leaves to be eaten by insects. You know, it's like what? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> but usually you can't even you can't. Oh, another one, the viburnum. I don't know if anybody's got familiarity with viburnum leaf beetle, but that thing is horrible too. Another introduced pest, and and they're all out of balance. Like they they they, they get introduced, and there's nothing to control them, and they, you know. But the, our native insects, though. I don't know. I don't know if I was to say always, but but for the most part, almost always, they, you know, they they have things that control them. Uh, you know, there's other there's there's predators and there's parasites and there's birds and there's you know all sorts of different things that uh, and predatory and parasitic insects um, that will control them. And so you know, it's not going to be like you're going to usually um, defoliate your plant or whatever. Well, then there's the tent caterpillars. That's another one. So it's it's a real range, but. Just looking at the value that those insects have to, you know, basically it means the plants are part of the ecosystem. That's that that, that that's what that that's what that means, and not just when they happen to have berries on them, but you know, all all year round or all year while they're while they're growing. Um, so yeah, it just, it, it's just it's just amazing how this, like I said, first this book, and then years and years and years and years later, <laughs> um, bringing nature home are, uh, are are really things that made me kind of had a big part in making me who I am. <laughs> so. Well, thank you for being who you are and for coming here and sharing it. You're welcome. Thank you.